Hello, hello, welcome everyone. So we have a couple more people trickling in, but uh, thanks everyone for joining us on a wonderfully rainy t uh, Thursday. It is a huge pleasure of mine to have Dr. Jed Sparks out here to present this week. Um, I got a chance to meet Jed at uh, the ESA conference this year. I've known some of the students. Uh, Hannah, one of his students, is here today, was a fee participant, so we're keeping that carry connection strong. Um, Jed got his bachelor's degree in science um, in biology from the University of Utah. Uh, I know that he told me last night that he was really inspired to get into science because of work of Lissy Coley and his experiences of getting to, to learn from her. So um, pretty awesome way to start your, your intro into science. And then uh, eventually got a um, PhD in botany from Washington State University. And so he lived out where I previously was just before I came to Cary, got to enjoy the Palouse. Um, I really enjoy the way that Jed approaches science because he, I think, has his specialties. Everyone kind of knows him for the stable isotope work, but I think he stays curious by exploring questions all over the spectrum. And if you read his abstract, which I hope you all do, uh, it's great. Um, I think it really emphasizes this idea that stable isotopes and biochem can kind of bring you into a lot of wonderful and exciting avenues. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to pass it over to you to get us going. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I give a seminar at the Cary all the time. We determined last night my last was in 2002. <laughs> So, 22 years ago. Um, as Jane said, I'm kind of known as an ecosystem ecologist. My lab works on plant stuff, but always at pretty large scales, um, airplanes, face rings, eddy covariants, all that stuff. And then whenever I go somewhere, like here, and I give a seminar, and you start talking, as my wife likes to say, in the isotope world, people only care about dead bodies, wine, and elephants. Um, and so I either talk about elephant feed work or I talk about dead bodies that we've helped find out who they are or I talk about how do we tell where that wine was grown. And so I said, well, why don't I just reverse it for one seminar and give it a shot? And I turn 55 next week, which means I finally get to give the E.O. Wilson whatever seminar I want now, I guess. That's what I was told in the department. So that's what I'm trying to do today. Um, happy to talk about geochemistry, ecosystem science with anybody anytime, but today we're not. We're gonna, here's a bit of a road map. I'm gonna give you a little motivational speech just in case you're sitting there and going, stable isotopes have not yet changed my life. I'm gonna show you how they should. Then your brain chemistry is gonna be really up and high, and then I'm gonna bore you to death with just enough information about stable isotopes that you know what I'm talking about for the next rest of the talk. And over that time, we're gonna talk about beer, color-changing birds, phosphorus and uranium, and then the collapse of the Hittite Empire in 1200 BC. All right, sound good? All right, motivation. Someone's been murdered. Um, <laughs> dead body has been found on the side of the road in Nebraska. She was in a coma for 17 days. She passed away. Um, remained a cold case for 30 years. They could never find out who this woman was. Um, and then we were finally approached and said, the police department, the cold case people said, can you help us figure out where she was the six months before she died? Because we have no record of this person anywhere. And they gave us bone tissue from her body. And we measured oxygen isotope ratios and strontium isotope ratios. And this map that you see, the dark and gray part is where her bone material suggests she was equilibrated with the water across the country. And then the light gray part is where it suggests her food contained ratios consistent with strontium in the Earth's crust there. And where it's red is where those two things intersect. So we have two lines of evidence, two isotopes of where she was from. So we reported back to them that she was um, probably from New Mexico um, or Vermont or potentially Northern California, Southern Oregon. They went to the local departments there, checked into all the missing persons, and it turned out she was a missing person from Vermont. Her body had been found in Nebraska. 
Um, my lab's not a crime lab. We're not certified. There's lots and lots of signing of envelopes and bags to be a certified lab, and we just do not want to get into that. But we informed the police department of where we think she might have been from. They found her. This turned out to be part of the case of the truck driver who was a serial killer, killing prostitutes across the country for 14 years, which they finally caught. Pressed yet? All right. How does this work? Well, across the United States, we can measure what the isotope, waters, isotope ratio is of the surface waters. This comes from thousands of measurements, and we can draw a map of the United States. This is called an isoscape. So if we just had an experiment here, and I said, hey, give me some of your hair right now. I can tell you where you've been. Can't tell where I've been very long, because I don't have hardly any hair. But there are a few people in the audience we might be able to go six, seven, eight years from where they're equilibrated to. Strontium is similar. This is all driven by the hydrologic cycle. Um, strontium is driven by the Earth's crust and its age, um, and they're very different. But that little tiny bit of strontium gets into your food. Everything you eat is incorporated into your body. And so you're keeping a record all the time of where you are based on what you eat and then the water that you're drinking and eating and food. Okay? And we bring those two things together, and that's how we can help police departments do things. Okay. We're not like manic depressives. We don't only work on dead murder victims. So sometimes we work on wine. So that, this is to make you happy. You're all depressed because of dead bodies, and this is wine. People really care where their wine grows. I don't completely understand why that is, but then I don't know plum from earthy, from butterscotch notes or whatever. I just drink scotch. So, But there are people in Croatia who will grow a wine and put a label on it saying it's grown in France, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but that Croatian bottle of wine is worth about $7, and the French bottle of wine is worth about $700. So there's a huge amount of fraud in the wine industry. And so what we can do is we can pull the headspace in the bottle through the cork, and we can measure the CO2, the oxygen isotope ratios, and we can tell where those grapes that made that wine were originally grown. Okay? We hate the new screw top, guys, because we have to sacrifice the bottle of wine. Um, just as an example, we'll do it somewhere where it's boring, because no one really cares if your Pinot Noir is from the Willamette Valley or Napa. But just to show you how it works, this is an isoscape of the wine growing regions of the United States. And so it's fairly easy to tell if you have a Pinot Noir that you really like. If you bought it in Napa and you thought it was Napa, if it was actually from the Willamette Valley in Oregon, it's really easy to tell because the isotope ratio is different. Okay? This ends the motivation. You guys are excited now. You think isotopes are so cool. I can tell there's at least one person nodding in the audience. So we're going to go over some very basic isotope stuff. So. Isotopes are simply the same element that has different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. Okay, so this is carbon. An example, the most common form of carbon on Earth is carbon-12. And it's called carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. Okay? Rarely, about 1% of the total carbon on Earth is a carbon-13. And it's a 13 because it has an extra neutron. So it has six protons, seven neutrons. Some elements have multiple stable isotopes. Many have radioisotopes. What's the difference? Carbon-14, which I'm sure you've heard of, this has eight neutrons. It's a radioactive isotope because it's undergoing decay. That nucleus isn't stable. Okay? So a carbon-13, a carbon-12, they are around. And unless they're in a nuclear bomb explosion or in a reactor, they're not going to change. Okay? This guy is eventually going to be a 15N, a 15 nitrogen. It will decay to another element. All right? We don't work with those. That's the rarely work with those. That's the turn your hair green, don't let you on airplanes, all that sort of stuff. Stable isotopes, not so much. They're totally safe, chemically inert, just like the other elements. Okay? And it turns out that that extra neutron makes a big difference. So just because of that extra weight, nearly every process that a molecule that has an atom, in this case carbon in it, it's harder to do that process with the carbon-13 because it weighs more, 
because it has that extra neutron. So any kind of process, and this can be almost anything, diffusion, an enzymatic reaction, all kinds of things, the, the ones that have the lighter isotopes are preferentially going to make it to the top of that energy hill. And that means that the signature of the process is left behind in whatever compound that you're interested in. Your body, a dead body, wine, whatever it is you're thinking about, okay? So if you can measure the difference in weight between an atom that has so many neutrons and one that has an extra one, you can get a lot of information. And all you need is a whole bunch of stuff and put it in a lab. I'm not gonna go into it. This technology is basically kind of invented in the 1920s, maybe 1915, and then it exploded in 1945. And that was because of the Manhattan Project. So the Manhattan Project figured out they needed to separate isotopes in order to make the bomb. And the technology that all these are based on, they're all the same. You have to come up with a pure gas, and we could talk all day about how I might take your hair or your toenail or some soil and turn it into a pure gas. We're going to skip that part. And then it goes into what we call the source, which is an electro. It's an electron beam. It's held at about 500 volts. And we pass a helium stream with this unknown pure gas in it. And that electron beam makes it into an ion. It charges it. And then that flows down the flight tube. And it hits this area. And all this area is is something that has a big magnet affecting it. And it grabs a hold of them based on their mass and their charge and deflects them, turns them in an arc. And the heavier they are, the less they arc. So the light isotope would arc this way and impact a sensor here. And the heavier isotope would not arc as much and impact there. And then those two things, they're called Faraday cups. All they do is count the number of times they've been hit by an ion. And that's where that ratio comes from. So we send 10,000 ions down there. We say X number of them were carbon 12s, X number of them were carbon 13s, and that's where the ratio comes from, okay? How many of you read a paper with stable isotopes in it? All right, you got to this, right? You said, what the holy hell is that? Um, this is what physics does to us. Um, what people do that measure something that's very small or very large is they link it to a known standard that everyone can use. And they put it in a place such that it will give us reasonable numbers so that you and I can talk about numbers like 10 or 12 or 5 or 6 rather than 0.00129734682.5. Okay? So what they do is we could report everything, and some forms of science do, in an absolute ratio. And this is PD belemnite, which just happens to be the standard that we match everything in carbon to. And if you make that measurement, the number of carbon 12s to the number of carbon 13s, you get a number that looks like this. Okay? And then if you're comparing two samples, you're going to be interested in differences out here in the number. So imagine giving that talk. You know, This rabbit was 0.0112372. This rabbit was 0112375. That's a lot of words. So what they do is they link this to a standard, and that's where delta notation comes from. So we measure an absolute ratio. So anything we're interested in, like a piece of hair, and we measure the ratio of the heavy isotope to the light isotope, and that's a number like that. Then we take that number, that's the R sample right here, and then we take the ratio of a known standard, and an R for carbon, it's gonna be PD belemnite. Anybody know what PD belemnite is? That's what's so funny. They picked the most random things. You know, you ever heard of the PD River? So there's a fossil in the PD River that um, had a nice isotope ratio. And in Vienna, they said, let's just use that. And so that's what it is. There's other isotopes people claim that it was a toilet seat in Vienna at the Atomic Energy Commission. I don't know if that's true or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. And you take those two things and you divide them, subtract one and times a thousand. And all that's really doing is it's taking these weird long numbers and making them into something that's really easy to think about, like a number like 10. And then when you read the paper, you'll see, oh, some of these are negative and some of them are positive. What in the world does that mean? All that means is how different are they compared to the standard? So in carbon, we're talking about 
this number is our standard. So if our delta number is bigger than that, we're going to get a positive number. So if you say a positive 5 per mil delta 13C, that means it's 5 per mil per thousand more heavy isotopes compared to the standard. Okay? If we go the opposite direction, if it's less than what PD bolemnite is, you get a negative value. So literally when you measure a leaf and you get a number like a negative 31 per mil delta 13C, it means it has 31 per mil per thousand less of the heavy isotope compared to PD bolemnite. Okay? Clear as mud, right? All right. Now, you know everything you need to know about isotopes, at least for this talk. So now let's talk about beer. All right. Beer. In 1516, so over 500 years ago, Bavarian nobleman passed, I can never say it right, Reinheist Gebot for beer, purity standards for beer. As far as we know, it's one of the oldest laws written down. It's definitely the oldest law that has anything to do with food. And what it stated was that the only ingredients that can be used in beer is water, barley, and hops. Yeast was added to it like 50 years later when they figured out there was actually yeast in all the beer that they were making. And this law stands to today. You go to jail if you make beer with anything else in it other than those ingredients in Germany. So that's like when you go to the store and you go, oh, I really want one of those Belgian beers that has anise or some other ungodly thing in it. That's because it's made in Belgium. It's not made in Germany. They would get in trouble in Germany. So being dorks, we decided, well, what can we do with this? We should really look for people who are cheating and putting bad stuff into beer. So we got to thinking. Here's barley. There's hops. These two plants are C3 photosynthetic. Doesn't really matter what that means. But what's important is that they have a distinct isotope ratio. Their isotope ratios are right around a negative 30. Okay? The number one thing on Earth that people add to beer during production is corn syrup. The reason they do that is to make money. You want to make beer fast. And corn syrup ferments really, 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 really fast. Okay? So they add corn. Corn is a C4 photosynthetic plant meaning its isotope ratio is over here, more like a negative 10 and negative 12. So, as you can imagine, it was so hard to talk people into doing this field work, we had to go around the world and get every beer that we could possibly find, drink it, pour it out into a cup, let it dry, scrape it off, run it on the mass spec. All right, so lo and behold, we published this paper. It was 20 years ago now, every time Someone comes to talk to me or everything, and I always go, are you the guy who wrote the beer paper? And I'm like, yes, I am. Um, and what it was was looking for how much of the C4 sugar is in beer depending upon where you are on Earth. Okay? Here's a figure from that paper. And what you can see is this is the amount of C4 carbon, so how much of the corn is in there. This line right here means it's a pure C3 beer. All these up here means that there's um, corn syrup added to it. Okay? In the US, the majority of all beers have corn syrup added to it. Same thing with Canada, Brazil. Everyone we tested from Mexico, Pacific Rim. Europe is split. And the ones that you see down here, these are German. So the Germans are actually standing by their law and not actually doing anything. Home brewers, we found like four of them. Turns out home brewers don't actually add any corn syrup to their stuff. All right, so beer. Now, the most important thing out of that data set is we can not just test the carbon, but we can, text, we can test the oxygen isotope ratios. And the oxygen isotope ratios will tell us where did the water in that beer come from. This is Coors beer. This is the tap water in Denver, Colorado. Golden, Colorado is a suburb of Denver, has the same isotope ratio. This are the isotope ratios of all the tap waters in all of the Rocky Mountains. Okay? 
And then these are five random Coors beers from around the world. Three of the five definitively are not using water from Golden, Colorado, which means the first thing you read on the Coors webpage is awesome because it says stubbornly brewed in the same Golden, Colorado brewery with 100% Rocky Mountain water and high country barley since 1873, which means Coors is a bunch of liars because <laughs> they're not. Obviously, there's breweries elsewhere in the world and they're making that beer using local water, not water from, so. One cool thing you can do with stable isotopes is find out that Coors is a big fat liar. Not sure it'll get you in the National Academy, but it sure is fun. All right, these next two come from times when I've been sitting in my office and things that I haven't thought about just get laid at my doorstep. So the first one is this guy. This is a horned lark. Um, and there was a graduate student at Cornell, and his entire thesis was this bird lives in the Imperial Valley, California, and if he looked at old museum specimens from the Imperial Valley in like 1890 and compared them to today, the coloration of the feathers are different. Okay? So what happened is the Imperial Valley transitioned entirely from high desert to entirely almost completely agriculture over that 100 years. But the horned lark didn't leave. The horned lark stayed there. So his question was, why in the world, what mechanism can we put on, why would birds change their color over time? And he said, can you tell anything about birds with isotopes? And I said, of course you can. And so he tested. These are old birds. These are birds from the museum from about that 1890 time frame. And these are modern birds. And the figure that you're looking at is what's called an isotope cross plot. The y-axis is the nitrogen isotope ratio. And what it means is where in the trophic position are you? So like, for example, if I took Hannah's entire diet and took the isotope ratio of all of that, she would be about 3.4 per mil more enriched, have more heavy isotope compared to her average diet. Okay. We could probably do everybody in this room, and Hannah would be really low because I know she's a vegetarian, and many of you probably are. Me and Matt, we'd be way up here because we're not vegetarians. We, we do Mountain Dew and cheeseburgers and stuff like that. So we're way different thing of where we eat our trophic position. So these birds are fundamentally different from old times to new times. Okay. But then I told Nick... Um, there's always a problem with these kind of isotope measurements because two things could have happened here. One is the old birds did feed at a higher trophic level, so they're not eating seeds, they're suddenly eating insects or horses or something much higher in the trophic level. But the other thing that happened is their baseline can change. So the baseline that was feeding the plants at the very bottom might be different between when it was a desert and now when it's agriculture, okay? We have a new fancy smancy way to test that within an organism, but we didn't have it at this point. So what we decided to do was Nick measured the isotope ratio of the modern agricultural environment and the desert relics is what they're called in the Imperial Valley. They're parts of the valley that never got converted to agriculture, so they're still sitting as high California desert. So this is the same kind of cross plot showing this N15, which shows the trophic position. Carbon, which carbon is basically showing you the um, carbon source. These are the birds again. So this is that new set of birds and these are the old birds. And then there's two new pieces of data on here. One, these are plants. So the light colors are the plants from the desert. The other ones are plants from the agricultural zone. The triangles are soils, desert versus agricultural. And if you look at this, not only has the baseline changed, yes, but it's changed in the opposite direction. So from old to new, it's gotten lighter. No, yeah, from new to old, it's gotten lighter. So this is definitely not a baseline shift. 
So we published claiming that it was a change in trophic position. And what we think is happening is in the old desert, horn larks are pretty flexible in what they eat, and they were eating mostly seeds in the desert. And now in the agricultural environment, they're eating insects. So they're eating lepidopteran larvae and things like that. And for whatever reason, being slightly different color helps in that kind of foraging is the working hypothesis. Okay. All right. This one is kind of biogeochemistry-ish. People who work with isotopes hate phosphorus. We completely, utterly hate phosphorus. And I'm going to try to explain to you why. First, I'll tell you why do we care about phosphorus. This is uh, Lake Okeechobee in Florida. And uh, the green stuff that you see in here, that's a cyanobacterial algal bloom. So this is really common in any low nutrient water body. In the US now, if nutrients are added to it, the primary consumer tends to um, really grow, cause the cyanobacteria kind of the worst because they also have these kind of poisonous side products that they put in the water and all of these things. And there's a lot of blaming that goes on. So this doesn't just stay at Lake Okeechobee or runs to the coast and every rich person in Florida is yelling and screaming because their river is green and has muck in it. Okay. There's two kinds of nutrients that are probably causing that. One's nitrogen and one's phosphorus. In the nitrogen world, stable isotopes have been applied for probably 30 years in this blame game of saying, okay, the nitrogen going into that lake is coming from here. So this is a relatively modern paper in 2020, but this is nitrate and they're doing oxygen isotopes and nitrogen isotopes in a cross plot. And then they can say, well, we can tell whether that nitrate is coming from septic systems. Is it coming from natural processes in the soil? Is it coming from ammonium and fertilizer? Um, so you're able to identify. So you can blame people. So you can say, well, it's, you know, Rick DeSantis can get mad at somebody and he can yell at them and say, you got to clean up your act. People who have farms, you got to clean up your act for the people who own septic systems, whatever it is. So we've done a pretty good job there. With phosphorus, which could also be leading this, it's very, very tough to tell where that phosphorus comes from. We've never had an ability to trace phosphorus very well. And the reason for that is that phosphorus is monoisotopic. So what that means is we've been talking about carbon, where there's a carbon-12, there's a carbon-13, nitrogen, there's a nitrogen-14, nitrogen-15. Phosphorus only has one stable isotope, phosphorus-31. Okay? There is no other isotope. We can't have any isotope ratios. So we can't do anything to trace phosphorus through the environment. Phosphorus, when it goes into a place and it's bad, it usually is appearing as this. This is phosphate. And for about 20 years, we've struggled to try and use the oxygen isotope ratio of the associated oxygen. It hasn't worked very well. That oxygen kind of exchanges with other things in the environment. And so we're unable to really use it to do much in the way of tracing. So we're kind of stuck in a position in Florida. The problem is the phosphorus is causing that algal bloom, could be this, could be from fertilizer, but it can also be from this. This is karstic limestone, and karstic limestone is leaching off phosphorus a little bit at a time over geologic time, right? So if I go into Florida and I say, we really want to change policy, we want to limit fertilizer application, this is going to be the look that DeSantis gives me there because we don't have any data to suggest which is which. And in the face of political pressure, a politician is always going to pick the one that's natural, because then it's not anybody's fault, and he doesn't have to do anything. Okay? So there's this big interest in trying to find something that will trace phosphorus. And especially for me, because I hate phosphorus, because I can't use it. Because every time someone says, what can I do with isotopes of phosphorus, and I go, a whole bunch of nothing is what you can do, because there ain't no such thing. So you need to look for another candidate 
what could you use that behaves like phosphorus in the environment is associated with phosphorus all the time. And one good candidate is uranium. So uranium, it is mobile in the environment about like phosphorus is. It's in the same soil granule that the phosphorus is. And there's a lot of it in fertilizer. So this blue bar right here, that's the amount of uranium in soil background. And then these black dots are fertilizer and feed supplements. So fertilizer and feed tends to have a lot of uranium in it, okay? And uranium has isotopes. None of them are stable. They're all radioactive isotopes, but there's 234 uranium, 235, 238. Don't ever try to do anything with 235. Um, my current postdoc tried to order some 235, and we got like the police come into the lab. Because 235 is the one that's the weapons grade uranium that you try to enrich and make a kind of a thing that goes boom really, really big. So don't get that one. 234 and 238, however, you can get, and they occur naturally. They're both radioactive and they're both decaying. Here's their decay pathway here. So here's 238, here's 234. This becomes thorium. They both eventually become thorium, but they have very different half-lives. So it's only about a quarter million years, and this one's much, much older, the half-lives on 238. I do not care if you understand the next part because I don't either really completely. Radioisotopes don't behave like stable isotopes. They are decaying at the same rate. And so they become linked that you will have the same amount of each one over time because they both have a constant decay rate until one's completely gone. And this is called the activity ratio. And so something like 238, 234, through time, its activity ratio goes to one really, really rapidly. And that just means the two radioisotopes are in unison, the same proportion between the two all the time, okay? And this is called the equilibrium state, right? That's really boring, except for there are certain cases when those two isotopes are not in equilibrium. And that's disequilibrium. And so if you imagine that this is some piece of soil somewhere, in the bulk solid of the soil, the 234-238 activity ratio is always one. Those two radioisotopes are decaying at the same rate, okay? As you get out near the rim, so imagine this is a soil that's slowly decomposing. It came from a limestone. When 238 goes to thorium, there's this thing called alpha recoil. And it actually kicks that thorium out and it decays to 234. What that means is that this activity ratio inside this decaying material is less than one, and the, ice, the ratio between 234 and 238 in the pore water is greater than one. Now what that ultimately means is you can tell the difference between a closed system, a decaying system, and where the, the uranium came from in the pore water. So why does that matter? Classic figure only a geologist would make. This shows what state the 238, 234 would be in in different parts of the environment. So anywhere that has this closed, so like a parent rock material, sedimentary rock, resistite, minerals, they're closed systems and this activity ratio would be one. Fine grains, which are, this is this outer part that is kind of being decayed slowly, sediment, soils, they're usually less than one. And then the aqueous stuff, so like underground water, the soil solution water, it's all greater than one, okay? So why in the world is that helpful at all with phosphorus? Well, the reason it is, is fertilizers, about 98% of fertilizers made in the United States are made from phosphorite. It's a rock. Every time you buy a bag of phosphorus fertilizer, it's ground up phosphorite. Phosphorite is a closed system. So its activity ratio is always equal to one. So if we find uranium in the environment, 
associated with phosphorus and its activity ratio is one, we have a really high confidence that it's fertilizer derived, okay? Everything that's coming from limestones in a place like Florida, so if you ever get a chance, the limestone, this is Karsten, Florida, is not gonna be one. It's gonna be that liquid phase that is greater, has an activity ratio greater than one because of that thorium alpha recoil, okay? So it means if we go into your backyard and we dig up some soil, we extract all the uranium from it, if we get the activity ratio of that uranium, we have a pretty good idea if you're putting phosphorus fertilizer in your backyard or if this is just coming from the br breakdown of sedimentary rock in the region, okay? So this is the difference. So this is the numbers. This is what fertilizer looks like in Florida. So the activity ratios are all right here around one, okay? This is all the stuff coming from limestones in Florida, and you see it's all above 1.1, okay? I was terrified when I first got into this because one and 1.1 sound really, really close to me. And so I only think in terms of delta numbers, so I actually made my postdoc convert these. <laughs> and it's about an activity ratio of one is a delta of about zero per mil, and 1.1 is about 100 per mil, and 0.9 is about a negative 100 per mil. So this is enormous. For an isotope person, this is giant numbers. We can really tell the difference between these two things, okay? So what are we doing with it? Well, we work in central Florida. This is Lake Okeechobee right here, and we work Buck Island Ranch. Buck Island Ranch was originally owned by the MacArthur Foundation, and then it was leased to Archibald Biological Station, and now Archibald actually owns it. And it's probably the longest term research-oriented active cattle ranch in the United States, okay? It's in the headwaters of the Everglades, so there's a lot of reason why you might be interested in controlling or understanding phosphorus, and it's just amazing. I mean, any place you can work and you can actually like control what they do with the cows, you actually tell the ranch manager, yeah, I want cows in this one, no cows in that one. It's a really, really great place to work. The way things are done in Florida for cattle is in the 50s, they came in and they took areas that were slightly higher. This whole pink area, this is Buck Island Ranch. This whole pink area is slightly higher and they made this into what they call improved pasture, which means they took all the um, vegetation off of it, they limed it, and they added tons and tons of fertilizer, okay? The lower parts of every ranch, like out here, these lighter areas, they've left this in natural Florida vegetation, okay? So you should have this experiment where after this 20 or 30 years of fertilizer, that this should just be this hotbed of phosphorus and these should be relatively lower, okay? We know that there's a phosphorus problem here because all the runoff in water in Florida is monitored by the EPA and all of the agricultural systems in Florida violate how much phosphorus is going into the water, okay? Slight problem. This is, we measured all the phosphorus on the ranch and if you remember that improved pasture area was like right through here, and guess what? It has the lowest phosphorus of anywhere on the ranch. So this place where a zillion tons of phosphorus was added, A, it's gone, we can't see it in the surface soil, and B, it's still leaking tons of phosphorus into the rivers and the canals and heading to the ocean, okay? So what in the world is going on? Florida's crazy. Um, this is what's called a spodosol. So this is the most common soil type in Florida. This is sand. This is obviously the organic layer up with the plants. And this is called the spodic layer. And unlike any other soil I've ever worked with, the phosphorus that's added here doesn't get bound. All of this, this acidic system has leached all the iron, all the aluminum, everything that would grab onto that phosphorus, and it's just gone, but then it gets stuck here. So this entire system is this pollution hot point based on somewhere we've never looked for it before, a meter below the surface. So what's happening is every time that the water table rises like this during the wet season, it mobilizes all this phosphorus, 
and it just goes that way and into the riverway. But all of our management is based on phosphorus measurements right here. Okay, so I'm gonna have to ask you to invite me back because the uranium samples are currently being run at MIT right now. So we don't have the numbers, but the idea is to demonstrate this huge amount of phosphorus right here is not geologic. It's not that Florida's just been putting it there from its karstic systems for a million years. It came from the fertilization events 30, 60 years ago, okay? And then we're gonna use that uranium to tr try and figure out where is it coming from and then how do you manage this? So some of our ideas are going to more tree-driven systems in there because the trees can actually get down to this phosphorus, right? But you'll have to wait. And besides that, I know you want to talk about the Hittite Empire, because that's what everybody wants to talk about. So I'll finish here. This is definitely a place you can say, I saw on Discovery Channel this, and you're wrong, and you'll be right, because I know nothing about the Hittite Empire. I mean, I read everything on Wikipedia, and I've tried to catch all the things, because everyone's asking me about the Hittite Empire, but I'm not a Hittite expert. So please be free to yell at me if I get anything wrong. All right. This is my friend Sturt. Sturt's from Australia. He's in the archaeology department. He's a very nice person. Um, Sturt came into my office one day with a piece of wood. <laughs> he said, I have this piece of wood right here. I said, that's cool, Sturt, thanks. Lots of people give me pieces of wood. And he goes, no, no, you don't understand. This piece of wood is from the Hittite Empire. I said, Hittite Empire. Do I know anything about the Hittite Empire? And I said, I do. King Midas was in the Hittite Empire, the guy who turned everything to gold. Then Sturt said, yeah, this wood is from King Midas' father's tomb in Western Anatolia, which is now Turkey. Okay. So I go, well, that's pretty cool. I got a piece of wood. He goes, oh, no, it gets better. Not only is it King Midas, but the Hittites are a part of a group of cultures about 12, 1100 to 1300 BC that faded out of history. It's called the Bronze Age Collapse, and it's most of the large Mediterranean civilizations just sort of fade away and disappear. They're replaced by the Assyrians. It's heavily studied, like what happened to all of these cultures. The, I've read most of this book now, but there's like writings that, you know, in 1198, some merchant said, all the grain is gone, the army is rebelling, they haven't been paid. So there's all these sorts of things. We generally know that the climate throughout Mediterranean, the Mediterranean region was drying at that period. We have some evidence for that, but there's nothing that really links um, the exact time that they disappear from history and anything environmental. So if we go back to this is the Hittite Empire, about 1300. So it's huge. It's all of Turkey. If you love movies like I do, in most of the Egyptian movies, the guys that they're fighting are always the Hittites. You know, the ones with the, the chariots and the other kind of helmets and stuff, those are all the Hittites. So this is a major civilization. And they just kind of completely fade away for no apparent reason that anyone knew of. But Sturt had got a hold of this piece of wood, and he's a dendrochronologist. He studies tree rings. And this is from a juniper that grew during the time of the Hittite collapse. Okay? And he said, Jed, look right here. We've got these dated to 1198 to 11, 1196 to 1198 BC. And look at how tiny these rings are. He says, that tells me that there was a drought, and a pretty big one during that time period. Is there anything we can do isotopically to demonstrate that there was an extreme drought then? I said, oh yeah, we can do that. And to do that, we're gonna back up, do 15 seconds of plant physiology. This is a stomata. These are the little pores on every leaf of every plant around. They open and they close and they let the CO2 in to do photosynthesis. And when they're open, the water goes out. So they're a dynamic control that the plant has over its carbon intake and water release. When you're droughting a plant, forgetting to water your plant in your office or your yard or whatever, what's happening is these are closing and they're staying closed for most of the day, protecting itself from complete hydraulic failure because of the drought. Okay? Carbon goes in and out of these 
and it gets fixed. CO2 gets fixed by an enzyme called Rubisco. Rubisco has a fixed amount of discrimination. It prefers the lighter CO2, every CO2 that has a carbon 12. But the more that these close, the less of a choice that enzyme has. So as it gets more and more close, it has to do more and more carbon 13. So it turns out that the delta 13 C value is very reflective of what this long-term stomatal conductance was. So what that means is in the juniper that Sturt found from 1200 BC, if the tree was under stress, or say it wasn't under stress, it should have delta 13 C numbers of about a negative 31 per mil. And in all those big rings, that's basically what we see in that juniper. If it was way under drought, it's going to be way more positive. And what that means is it's getting, having to use more and more of that heavier isotope. It would be about a negative 21. And in those three consecutive years, that juniper had numbers between a negative 19 and a negative 23, which means it was under extreme drought during that time period. And so we wrote a paper, and we said, well, it's not just that there was this one drought. There was three in a row. And we know that ancient people stored grain, usually about a two-year supply. And so three years overcame most of these civilizations in Western Anatolia, which is Turkey today. And that's why there was this massive collapse. Okay. Um, Sturt was happy. He's smiling right there. Um, and we got it in, into nature. And so I, I mean, I, I think I've had six, six nature here or something like that in my career. And usually they're real sciencey. So your stodgy old friends call you and go, that was a very nice, very nice paper you put into nature. If you publish something in nature that you say climate change destroyed an entire civilization, it's not your old stodgy friends. It's the frickin' New York Times. I mean, I spent like three days of people just yelling at you and wanting quotes day after day after day. And it was hilarious. I'm the only non-archaeologist on the paper, because of course it's their wood, right? And we all get interviewed by the New York Times, and the New York Times only uses my quotes in the entire article. And Sturt calls them and goes, don't you think you should have at least one archaeologist? And the New York Times says, his are so much more exciting. You know, because the every archaeologist goes, well, in the Bronze Age collapse in 1283, you know, it goes on for like seven hours. And I'm like just geeking out saying like stuff that you could never get away with saying. I'll give you an example. Oh, here it is in The Guardian, because this is where the, the quote was. My wife makes fun of me for this quote. I think this study really shows the lessons we can learn from history. The climate changes that are likely to occur for us in the next century will be much more severe than those the Hittites experienced, Cornell professor of ecology and evolutionary biology and study co-author Judd Spark said, and it begs the question, what is our resilience? How much can we withstand? <laughs> I was like in shame for like three days, and I'm like, that is so cool, it's in the New York Times, right? Um, then instead of like weird, stodgy people calling you, like people that I hadn't seen since high school, sent me like messages on Facebook that said stuff like this. Dude, was that really you in the Washington Post? <laughs> and then the next line would be, we never saw that coming, ever. <laughs> All right, it's 10 minutes, two, and I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to stop there. Any ISO questions, fair game. Don't know if we'll be able to answer it, but I sure will try. Right. Thank you so much. You bet. Second talk in a row about the Hittites. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't think we've had that, that come up before. Um, really exciting. Uh, just a reminder to paraphrase or repeat the questions for those of us in the audience. And we'll and change it up. if I don't like it. Yeah, yeah and change if you don't like it. Um, do we have any opening questions from our audience? Evan. How about? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You control the room. No, you do. Okay. Go we'll go one, two, three. We do. Um, it's not anything new for me. It's been used in geology for 50 years. And so geologists for aging strata, carbon is really terrible. They hate it. It's not very accurate. There's not a lot of carbon in the rocks, everything. And so they developed the uranium-234-238 as a clock. Um, 
and it has to do with this weathering rate and how out of dis disequilibrium it is. So when you think, whenever you read anything that tells the strata ages, it's probably done with that clock by a geologist. It's way less useful for like anything that's not deep time, right? So like we couldn't, we couldn't age elephant ivory or big trees in the tropics or anything with this because you just don't have the resolution. So you have to use carbon, but it's commonly used in geology. You are integrating what's called CICA, which is the internal CO2 concentration to external CO2 concentration. So I say it that way because it's not just stomata. It's also the fixation rate, boundary layer, and so there's more things that go into it. But whatever the time frame that that carbon was fixed is going to be related to that stomatal behavior. So that means if you took this year's leaves, it would integrate the behavior of that for the entire lifetime of that leaf, okay? or at least its growth time. Okay? If you used, you extracted non-structural carbohydrates, for example, that might be the stomatal behavior of that day. Okay? Wood might be, tree ring might be of an entire year. So isotopes are always integrating the, the time period that it took to make whatever it's gonna make. Okay? So like, if I wanted to know what you ate this morning, I would want your blood. I'd want the human blood. If I wanted to know what you've eaten over the last 30 days, I'd want a piece of your liver, sorry. Um, if I wanted to know what you'd eaten over the last couple of years, I'd want a strand of your hair. And if I really wanted an integration of your lifetime, I'd want bone. I would want some of your bone. Because each one of those types of tissue are integrated over different time frames. You bet. Um, could do, but um, the long story of that, which I love, and I'm supposed to be paraphrasing all these, and I haven't paraphrased any of them, so you're just going to have to forget about the last two online people, sorry. Uh, the third one is I refer to a fancy spancy method for determining the baseline from within the organism, and so I'm going to talk very smartly about that right now. Um, if I measure your hair, or your body, or anything, I'm taking a bulk measure of the nitrogen isotope ratio in your body. But not everything in your body gets enriched in the same way. And in 2001, what we figured out is among the essential amino acids in your body, about half of them enrich based on your diet, and the other half of them don't. They just match your environment, okay? So instead of a bulk measurement, if I took a blood sample or some part of your body or something like that, I could extract those amino acids and do the isotope ratio of the enriching ones and compare them to the non-enriching ones. And then it wouldn't matter what the baseline was because you're telling me what your baseline is. I don't have to figure it out. I'm gonna jump in and ask a question about okay. uh, tracking manure fertilization versus a pure phosphorus source or something like that. How um, how easy is it to determine the different uh, source of your fertilizers? As far as we can tell, there isn't enough resolution in the uranium to tell the difference between what came out of a cow and what came out of a bag. And that's mostly because the cow is eating ultimately the same stuff that came out of the bag, right? And so the feed supplements, the other stuff. So the only thing that's really differentiating is geologic time frame kinds of phosphorus. Unfortunately, but we don't really know. I mean, it hasn't really been used in this way, so there's probably more information in there than we know, so we just gotta keep playing with it. I didn't need to paraphrase that one, right? Yeah. Talk. So you talked about how 
you can use stabilized to determine trophic level, but you know, I've seen papers that looked at um, human, like human fossils and determined which, which sorts of animals they were hunting, which is more granular than trophic level. So, I mean, how could you use stabilized to determine something at that level of granularity? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I would have believed the paper that identifies the animal, but, you know, like everything that's ever been reported of early hominids, so all of our ancestors, that was all done from isotopes of their teeth. Um, now, what a person does, as we'll have to use our imagination here, is we can each, either in two dimensions do carbon and nitrogen, and then we're going to look at some group of organisms from some time. And their correlation is going to make a cloud of points like this. We make it fancy, even add sulfur in a third dimension, and it's going to be this ball of points. And then we call that the isotopic niche, that it in some, or niche, depending upon what you like, um, you, it defines sort of its ecology, what it feeds, where its energy sources are, where everything comes from. And then we look at another group of organisms, and their cloud of points is over here. They don't overlap one another. So we make the assumption, okay, those things are doing very different things. I think there's a lot less um, information in knowing exactly what those groups of things are eating, but their differences are very real. Like, for example, I just had an undergrad do a project on, they had fish samples from 1930 to today from a river near Cornell, and over that time, the Ohio River has flooded into the Susquehanna twice. And when it did, it brought a passenger along as this novel fish species that had never been there before. And when it got there, there was a fish perfectly doing what that other fish had been doing in the Ohio River. And so if you go back to that first point of contact, those two clouds of isotope points are right on top of each other, like this. And then if you move in the collection 10 years later, they're like that. And then 20 years later, they're like that. And 30 years later, they're like that. So they're separate. you're watching evolution in real time, well, in that time of that happening and separating. And then we can match that with things like morphology. So we take those same fish and I collaborate with morphologists who say, well, the mouth parts and the gut volume and all these things have also changed in that time. So I think those kinds of things. It's this new burgeoning field called cyber analysis. You've probably seen that, S-I-B-E-R. Um, I think there's a lot of information there, but I mean the ancient like hominid one, if we go back for that, they were really separating between nitrogen fixers, C4 originating things, and C3 originating things. Like the idea that our ancestors were on savannas is because they have both C3 and C4 carbon in them. And what we know about those floras is it means they must have been getting some stuff from trees and some stuff from grasses in Africa at that time. But like knowing whether it's grass A or grass B or tree A or tree B, you don't really have that kind of resolution. Yeah? You've gone over a lot of stuff that's been super exciting and just kind of different from what we're used to, but I'm wondering for you, what is your current work that you're doing that you're most excited about or something that's coming down the pipeline? Two main things we're doing right now. The first one is really pushing on this uranium phosphorus dynamics thing. And then the second thing is methane and management of methane. So my two big actual funded projects, one is uh, National Park Service is reconnecting tidal in Cape Cod. And we're monitoring with eddy covariance and a bunch of other things, what's that's gonna do to total carbon cycling in um, Atlantic estuaries. The other big project is in these Florida farm systems, ranching systems. They represent a huge land cover area across the world, so it's subtropical, semi-improved grasslands. And they produce, like, if you go to Oklahoma, 100% of the methane is coming from the cows. If you go to Brazil, 20% is coming from the cows, and 80% is coming from the ecosystem that it's underneath. So we work a lot on what are the management levels that a land ma management levers that a land manager can use to help mitigate that methane? You know, it's part of its planting. A lot of that methane goes through plants. So there's a special plant tissue type called arenchyma, which is an adaptation to flooded landscapes. But the methane loves to leak out through that. The second is water control because you change the amount of diffusive length that the methane can oxidize over. And then the others are what are things that we do to the soils that change production, methan er, methanogenesis. I didn't 
That, that's great. All right. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Let's thank Jed one more time. But, 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 yeah. Go ahead. And then for those of us here, we'll have lunch. Um, so please feel free to join us and keep the conversation going. Thank you so right. much. Thank you, guys. Wow.